Amindeli Agbashebe uh, Demerson. He's, um, he serves as chief curator of the African American Museum and Library at uh, Oakland, a branch of the Oakland Public Library. Uh, he's, he served in executive positions at George Washington Carver Museum, Cultural Genealogy, Genealogic uh, Center in Austin, Texas, uh, the International Civil Rights Center and Museum in Greensboro. Uh, he asked me not to read his, his whole uh, uh, bibliography, I mean, excuse me, his whole biography, uh, but let me just tell you, if you looked it up, it's extensive. And we're very fortunate to have him today to talk about the African family. And so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our, our brother, our friend, brother uh, Bamandeli Agba Sangbe. Okay. Yeah. Demerson is easy. <laughs> no, I, I want to get it. I want to, I want to say it. And, and before you start, I just want to, I just want to welcome and recognize a long time, um, we'll say uh, member and supporter, her family, uh, Sister uh, Carolyn Baxter Reams uh, has joined us today. She's, she's like in that first group of people uh, uh, that, that were part of WallSafe. So um, I'm not going to ask her to speak right now, but, I, uh, but maybe later on at the end, uh, 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 she might have a few words for us. Go ahead, Brother Bob and Daly. Okay. Well, good afternoon, family. I'm very pleased to be here. The sun is shining in my face because even though I have, um, I do have a screen in front of my window, uh, the light still comes through. So, uh, but that's not going to interfere with me seeing. I want to just establish, uh, you know, if there's some question or some issue, stop me at that point. Uh, and so that we can clarify, I would much rather us to have a shorter discussion, but a more clarified discussion than an extensive one in which there are possibly some, um, I don't, I just want to make sure that we create as little opportunity for misunderstanding. Let me see if I can share my screen. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, can you can you direct me? What do I do after I press the share screen button? Okay, uh, so you share the screen, and then there's uh, there's like a square that says share sound. Oh, okay. Oh, you got it there. Okay, all right. Okay, well, I'm going to leave these um, all of these uh, little things on the side because that will help me to know where I am in the presentation. So we're looking at. Um, African families, and by that I mean African as well as African American, but uh, the the genesis of this uh, of this presentation really started in our uh, study session that deals with the Husia, and um, so one Sunday morning we were talking about the Husia, and noticed that there were several passages that dealt with. Um, relations between humans and particularly between um, husband and wife. And so that generated further discussion. And so we extended our session. And, and so I don't think oh, many people went to the, um, um, uh, to the session just prior to uh, the Sunday uh, service, uh, the meditation. And so we discussed African families. So this uh, session is, is very broadly titled Understanding Kinship, Marriage, Kinship, Family, Marriage, and Gender in African and African-American Cultural Memories from West African Traditional Sources. So I'm looking a little bit at African-American families and the sources that, uh, of Africanity that define the way they exist, operate, and, um, uh, and love each other in this world. So the ethnographic notes shared in this presentation are based on, um, on observations from fieldwork 
uh, in Nigeria, West Africa. And that's primarily during the 70s and 80s. But it's also based on my field work in South Carolina among the Gullah people on the islands that are off the coast of South Carolina. Now, I noticed that we, um, we had a session on the Gullah uh, uh, last year sometime uh, when uh, Sister Debbie did a presentation uh, on that population. So these observations, and that's from, that's from my work in the 70s. These observations have been supplemented with uh, research efforts by anthropologists, uh, sociologists, and even psychologists. The photographs and diagrams and illustrations in this presentation <clears throat> are for the most part from uh, sources published on the internet. So I have definitely borrowed these images and I just want to make sure that I acknowledge that. <clears throat> this is a, um, a very short bibliography. So if you um, uh, if you go in after after this session is over, um, uh, tomorrow or the next day, you can perhaps download and copy this, uh, this particular page. And so these are some bibliographic entries. And so I want to start out with um, my chapter in a book called Sea Island Roots, African Presence in the Carolinas in Georgia. And uh, Dr. John Henry Clark wrote the foreword to this book. And I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to say, I didn't know that he was going to write the foreword, but I was very pleased when I learned that he was doing that, um, primarily because he's a great scholar and, uh, and secondarily because my work is in this book. And so I'm very pleased to be introduced by him. Um, and Dr. Clark was someone that I would meet at conferences from time to time, and he would come to Ann Arbor and to Detroit, which is where I lived in uh, both of those cities. <clears throat> uh, but he would come uh, frequently. And so um, after the sessions were over, all of, the, all of the young people, and I was young at that time, would be sitting uh, quite literally at his feet. Um, oh, just one second. Okay, I was stopping because there was, uh, I had an interruption from um, the loudspeaker uh, for, the, for the museum, it's about to close. And so uh, my chapter in this book was titled Family Life on Wadmalaw Island. You know, some time ago when, we, when I learned that um, um, I was going to engage in, in field work or become an anthropologist, one of the things that I learned that sometimes it's very important to do engage in comparative studies so and then you try to find institutions uh, that are very similar and that should help you to explore, explore and uh, understand the differences between them. So you don't want to get those that are so very different that you uh, sometimes the comparisons would be a little bit more difficult. But you should try to understand those institutions that are similar and then highlight their differences so that you can see understand what um, what is the relationship between the two and at the same time. Uh, in what ways are there differences? And so I want to emphasize two quotes uh, that, uh, that were in this, uh, uh, that you see here from Du Bois and Sudarkasa. And so Du Bois tells us in 1908, in perhaps the first scientific or social scientific study of the African-American family, attempt to connect conditions with the African past. This is not because Negro Americans can trace an unbroken social history from Africa, but because there is a distinct nexus between Africa and America, which though broken and perverted, is nevertheless not to be neglected by the careful student. And uh, then we have this um, quotation from Sudarkasa, which reads, uh, let me go back up to the other. Um, the issue that requires clar 
clarification in studies of African and Afro-American family structure concerns the principles upon which these families are organized. The implications of the operation of the principle of consanguinity in relation to that of conjugality must be fully explored before the dynamics of Afro-American families can be appreciated and their similarities to African families and differences from Euro-American families fully understood. Now that's a whole lot. Um, and so I recognize that this is a whole lot. And so let me explain a few terms. We are accustomed to using the terms nuclear and extended. And those are terms that I have used in the past. I have graduated, and I'm saying graduated in quotation marks, away from the use of the term extended and nuclear. Um, the nuclear family, as we are told, is really the husband, wife, and their children. And they are conceptualized as the nucleus. And onto that, you have um, extensions of the nucleus, which are, uh, and so then we get the term extended family. We have a tendency to equate household with family, when in fact, not all families are in fact households. F families are sometimes, or households are sometimes uh, several of them will constitute one family because they operate and function as one family. So, um, so the other term that was used uh, uh, when I was a student in sociology and cultural anthropology was conjugal family, which per per perhaps is a far more um, um, appropriate term because it does not impose the fact that it is the nuclear or the nucleus of anything. Uh, because in Western societies, we have learned to appreciate, uh, quote unquote, the nuclear family. And so we see everything else as an extension of that. But in fact, many families are built not around the uh, conjugal bonding, but the blood bonding or the consanguineal bonding. And so when we look at and talk about Black families, uh, especially cross-culturally, but uh, certainly on the continent of Africa, we, um, um, uh, we are talking about the so-called extended families or the uh, consanguineal families. Now, I contributed to this book, uh, Extended Families in Africa and the African Diaspora. And my chapter was uh, titled, Women, Patrilateral Kinship and the Family Compound Among the Rural Gullah. Now, the Gullah are African-American people. But if you uh, go there, you see um, groups of households uh, that are grouped together, and that, in fact, they, uh, in my mind's eye, look like compounds. And so this, uh, this um, but before I get to that, let me say that this book was edited by Osei uh, uh, Mensa Aborampa from Ghana, and my professor, the late Niara Sudarkasa, um, from the uh, United States, but she had Bahamian roots. And so um, I'm very pleased that, uh, that she encouraged me to contribute to this book because I was not going to do so, but I went ahead and I wrote this, uh, this article. And I told her, I said, I am not going to use the term extended family at all in my article. She said, well, what, how will people know what you're talking about? And I said, well, I hope that they will get it from, you know, when they read it, understand that I'm speaking about um, uh, uh, families that are based on consanguinity. So this opening paragraph, in societies across Africa and in many communities throughout the African diaspora, the family is often a multi-generational group of close kinspersons living together in a cluster or set of adjacent households called the compound. 
Consanguineal or blood relationships constitute the ties that bond the members of the family together. That is to say, the family compound is built around a core of blood related persons. The land on uh, which the set of households is established, moreover, is frequently owned collectively by an even larger body of blood relatives, many, if not most of whom, do not reside in the family compound setting. And so that's important to understand that although households are important, People come and go, people move away, they migrate out, but nevertheless, the family homestead is still there and it's important. And so when we look at the Smith's uh, family, and this is, a house, this is a family from the Sea Islands or from the Gullah area, we have um, households A through E. So we have six households that quite literally function as a family. Now the houses are in different um, levels of uh, independence, but they are all interdependent in ensuring the well-being of everyone, especially the children. And so we see in the first generation, um, one, two, three, and four. And with this little, uh, um, this little U-shape, um, um, uh, element in the genogram indicates marriage. Sometimes you will see an equal sign. And so we see one and three are brothers because they are linked by a line uh, indicating that they have blood kinship. But they married uh, two different women and then they each had children. And so we see um, um, uh, in the second generation, we have uh, five and six who are married, seven and eight who are married without children, nine who is not married uh, and who was um, involved in a divorce, and, uh, and nine has a child. And uh, we have uh, households E and F which are 10 and 11, 19 and 20. Now, when you see a triangle, you're, uh, the triangle generally refers to, well, not generally, it refers to males and the circle refers to females. Now I put this little hyphen uh, uh, next to those that are, that are deceased. And so you will see that in, um, in household A, Uh, the children of five and six had a daughter, 15. Now, uh, of course, she's older than 12, 13, and 14, but um, she had a child. She was not ma married at the time that she had a child, and they sent her to live with her grandmother uh, in the household B. All of these houses are in the same compound, but they were concerned about B getting elderly. And so they wanted to make sure that there was um, a, a young adult who was there in the role to look after and to care for her. And so this is a decision that was made collectively. And so while all of these uh, households have their own, uh, their own heads, notice that five, is the head of the household A, and he's also the head of household B. Um, and so, um, because the mother is now elderly, she is not really living independently. And one of five's children is living in that household, helping to take care of her. So this gives us some sense of family dynamics in South Carolina. And these are African-Americans who have retained some sense of their, a profound sense of their Africanity when we look at uh, uh, family structure. So the idea that I wanted to take away from here is that these households are also, uh, or these kin groups, or uh, these compounds are patrilaterally extended. They're extended on the father side. And so that's what patrilateral means. Um, uh, so, so uh, in the youngest generation, 12, 13, 14, 15, and, and 21 are all um, patrilaterally related because they're related to five, 
and we go up to the first generation, they're related to one. They are also related to seven, as well as three, nine, 10, uh, and 19. <clears throat> so, um, but all of these persons, you know, 17, 18, 16, and 22, they are all part of the patrilateral extended family. I perhaps could have uh, shaded them in a tone of gray to indicate that they were all members of the same family. But when we think about family compounds, and then we look in West Africa at uh, compounds. And so when we think about cultural memory, what have we remembered from one generation to the next? And even through slavery, uh, what we have tended to emphasize in African-American families, in contradistinction to European-American families, we talk about blood kin. When you say family, what do you mean first? Do you mean your husband, wife, and your children? Or do you mean, uh, or do you mean your, uh, your blood-related persons, and especially if you're living in a family compound situation? Even if you're not living in a family compound, in modern day cities, sometimes when people are living in apartment buildings and they are not landowners, they often live in the same apartment buildings so that even if you're on different floors uh, or even the same floor, but one, you know, two houses might be on, uh, households might be on one floor of the apartment and one above, but they, all three houses interact and function as one family. We seem to have forgotten about that, and we don't write about that in the sociology of our experience. And so we tend to talk about households as families. So we tend to talk about, oh, um, a broken marriage as if it's a broken family. It is not necessarily a broken family, although divorce is not good and is not ideal, but the family is not broken. The, the marriage has become injured or the marriage has become broken. And so therein lies the significance of uh, making that delineation. And that argument holds even stronger for African uh, families, meaning from the continent of Africa. Now, I just have a few examples of, of, of compounds. You'll notice uh, here on the lower, um, uh, the lower left image, you see clusters of uh, houses that are linked by a, uh, a fence that surrounds a group or connects uh, houses together. And so that would be one cluster of household or one compound. In this, this is one compound. You'll notice there's a house back here. We see one here, we see one here. And this is, uh, uh, this is not a house, but this is a granary. And notice that, uh, and this is perhaps in a, uh, a society that traces kinship patrilineally. Often uh, in West Africa, when you have granaries that are uh, placed up above, often they sit on pillars as if to emphasize, you know, this is the male principle or the phallic symbol. And the granary is round. It holds the grains, the promise of life for throughout the year. And so there's symbolism in the, um, uh, uh, often in these families. So you have this, uh, this, round, uh, this round structure, which is topped with a conical roof. And in it, you would place the grains like, um, um, like rice that is harvested from one year. And you've taken the harvest for that year and you then thrash it and you place it in the granary and it's there for uh, the, it, until the next season, the next growing season. So even in the architecture, there is a similarity, or oh, there, um, um, there is a way of uh, symbolizing male-female relationships. And um, uh, this symbol, some of you are familiar with Adinkra symbols. This symbol is known as Fihankra. It refers to um, 
safety, safety or security. And it's modeled, uh, and this is among the uh, Asante people of Ghana. We're looking at the inside of a compound. And so we see the courtyard and the, uh, you know, this is household A. And so we have A here, this is household B, household B here. And so we would have C and D on this side and this side as well. And so there is a common door or, or a door that facilitates entry to as well as exit from the household. But when that door is closed, that family is secure. And so that's why Fihankra is, uh, is taken as a symbol of security or safety. And so that the household is the model for that Adinkra symbol. Are there any questions or any comments before we move forward? Okay, well then I will continue to talk. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about kinship, family, and marriage in West African traditions. And this is simply an introduction. So we're going to talk about three things, kinship, co the co-residential family compound, and marriage. And I'm going to take most of my examples from the Yoruba people um, uh, of Nigeria and Benin in West Africa. And so we have this, um, uh, we have this uh, family, this consanguineal family here, or as some would say, the extended family. And so, and notice that they are all uh, dressed in the same, um, same fabric. So, uh, sometimes this is their family cloth for whatever event or special event that occurred. But notice the, the husband and wife here, and that uh, these are the three sons, the three uh, or four adult sons, and they each have their wives and children uh, with them. And th uh, this is perhaps a single daughter who has not married yet. And so this is how the family presents itself. Uh, now, when we think about uh, kinship, we have to think about um, corporate descent groups or lineages. Uh, you, I, I think that um, lineages were, were referred to in Dr. Obatashaka's uh, uh, presentation. And so there are two types, primarily two types of lineages. There are patrilineages, which as you can say, uh, oh, and I misspelled this word instead of, this should be P-A-T-R-I-L-I-N-E-A-G-E. And then matrilineages. Patrilineages are descent groups that are traced through a line of fathers. Matrilineages are descent groups that are traced through a line of mothers. And so those are the two principal types of lineages that you have in West Africa. And so if you see here, uh, the, you see the male, which is the triangle, the equal sign, which indicates that they are marriage, and the circle. The circle, of course, is a wife of the lineage. She is not a member of of the patrilineage, but she is married to someone in the kin group. And so the members of the lineage are all noted in black. You have this male, this female, and this male. They are all members, they are all patrilineally related, so they belong to the same lineage. Now, this is a genogram. In the next generation, you have this daughter and this son. They are related to, uh, they are the uh, uh, children of this male and the grandchildren of this male that uh, wh where I have my cursor. So they are all related, related in a line. This woman is also a member of the patrilineage because her father uh, she's linked to the patrilineage through her father, but her children are members of her husband's patrilineage. So we see that lineages are very significant to uh, in African societies. And in this uh, uh, um, 
uh, this member of the patrilineage, this male, is also married, and his children are members of the uh, of the, the patrilineage. Now we have here uh, a circle, a triangle, which are female and male. And the central character here is designated ego. It could be a male or a female. And so for illustration purposes, the person who created this diagram was talking about patrilineages and saying from the person, whether a male or female, all of these persons are members of the same pat, uh, patrilineage. Now in matrilineage, it's a, a little bit different. And the reason why I'm pointing out this is because when we think of um, corporate uh, descent groups, uh, whether you are matri patrilineage or matrilineage, you have to think about what, and, and this is described as a corporate descent group, simply because these groups act as corporations. They have property to protect. And so they sometimes, uh, occupations are transmitted Intergenera intergenerationally. And so this word says intergenerational transmission. You probably can't see it uh, because of, of the um, uh, images that are, um, uh, our images that are on the side. But often in a lineage, and particularly a co-residential lineage or, or people that live in a compound, the men, might have a similar occupation. So they might be keepers of birds. They might be a, um, um, they might uh, have, uh, they might be owners of date uh, palm trees. And so they harvest the dates. And so they have to protect their interests. And so there are occupations that are transmitted intergener intergenerationally. Titles, uh, you know, some houses, um, you know, say for example, in Yoruba kingdoms, there might be uh, in, in any one uh, uh, kingdom, there might be several houses that can supply the next king. And so the king, uh, the, the title of king or Oba is, um, is moved from one household to the next in, uh, when one king lives and dies, then it, it, it might be moved to the next household. And so, or the group might uh, vote on who should be the next king, or there would be some way of determining that. <laughs> then you have uh, divinities are, trans, uh, are transmitted intergener intergenerationally as well. And then of course, most importantly, the right to use and to own land. And that's uh, transmitted from one generation to the next. So often the members of the, um, um, of the lineage will meet and to determine their, uh, their interests, whether it's a focus on occupations, titles, divinities, or, or honoring the divinities, or allocation for land to be used and uh, and land to be owned. And so is that clear? Okay, and so let's look at a co-residential family compound. And so we see this here, we see um, the consanguineal family is uh, another term that I said that I don't use, but it would be called the extended family. And it is built around a, a segment of a lineage. And in this case, a segment of a patrilineage. At the head um, of the compound is the oldest uh, or the eldest male. He's known as the Bale or his title within that compound is Bale. And then the um, senior brother, most- Brother Bauman Daly, this mm -hmm. is, is this uh, Yoruba? Um, yes, it is. Okay. Yes, okay. it is. I just wanted to verify that. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, this is Yoruba. And so the senior most female, not necessarily the ballet's wife, but the senior most female is known as the Iale. And so, um, and this, you know, uh, in Yoruba compounds, seniority 
a birth and seniority of marriage means everything um, uh, because it determines right of access or who gets the first choice or who gets the right to make a decision. And so uh, in terms of seniority of marriage, whoever is the, um, not the eldest wife, but the longest uh, wife that has been married into the lineage, who has been married into the lineage the longest, would be the Iyale. And so we have, uh, as we understand, um, we perhaps tend to think of, well, uh, the, um, in the African-American family, um, as here, um, the, in the generation above um, one and three, that person would have been the eldest, um, uh, the eldest male and his wife, and they would have been considered the heads of the family. But in the Yoruba system, it is um, the woman who, who, is, uh, who is married uh, earliest into that family that is the Iyale. And so there's a seniority of birth. Uh, there's a seniority of marriage. And so we can talk about the wives of the compound um, because the wives, we, we, how is it that people in this society can live with so many people in a compound. Some of these compounds are so large, much larger than this illustration that we have here, but there might be 1,000 people who are the inhabitants of one compound. Now, it's usually not that many. It might be um, at most of uh, one or 200, but uh, it's certainly larger than two or three um, uh, conjugal families or so-called nuclear families. And so the conjugal family Brother, is- Brother, built Brother mm -hmm. Bonham Daly, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, this came up uh, the other day um, and, and you may have already uh, touched on this. I don't think you have, but are you gonna talk about uh, polygamous families? Yes, I am, very okay. definitely. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I couldn't <laughs> leave out that topic. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I understand wherever you find some black people, there's going to be polygamy some kind of way, you know, just yeah, some kind of way, either, some people, either some structured or unstructured. You know, yes. Well, you know, as uh, uh, one sociologist said, you know, uh, black men in America play at polygamy. <laughs> Yes. But even that statement yeah. is not fully true because it is real for some and not for others. So we find that the conjugal family is built around a married, uh, a married couple. That's important. We have learned to call that the nuclear family. But there is something also important that when we speak about um, uh, males and females, uh, we have to speak of, about gender-linked roles and the complementarity of gender-linked roles. Now, the term that was used uh, a couple of weeks ago when uh, Dr. Tashaka uh, spoke uh, to this group, he talked about twin lineal. Now, remember, I talked about the matrilineal and the patrilineal. And uh, and even though you're related to the members, to uh, members of both your mother's uh, family and your father's uh, father's lineage, and your members of your mother's lineage, um, there is a sense of bilateral kinship, meaning that you're related to both, but you emphasize one or the other. Um, and so, among the Asante, they emphasize matrilineage. Uh, among the Yoruba, they emphasize patrilineage. Among the Igbo, they emphasize patrilineage. Uh, and so that becomes important. So we look at this compound and we see, and I found this early photograph, today, instead of the thatch roofing, uh, people uh, today use um, corrugated uh, tin sheeting or iron sheets. Um, as roofs. 
So sometimes these houses can be very warm, but uh, we can see a, uh, a structure of a compound that's here. And so we see how these uh, uh, rooms, individual rooms are built. And um, we see one courtyard here, we see a secondary courtyard, and we see the entrance to the compound. Uh, often, so we see bedroom, sitting room, bedroom, bedroom, sitting room. And so then we have, um, but you'll notice uh, here, notice that along the eaves of the house over, uh, drop over a veranda. And so we have that here. Now, sometimes you have long houses uh, as we have here. And this is a smaller compound. And so it's built around a smaller segment of a lineage. Uh, the compound here is a little bit larger segment of a lineage. And so, you know, you can't possibly have a full lineage living in one house because a lineage is indeed, they're multi-generational and they extend outward. Can, can I ask you about Brother Bauman Daly? Yes. So um, when these houses are constructed, is it a communal? Uh, everybody gets involved in the construction or is it just that particular, those that are going to inhabit it? How, how does that work? I think for the most part, it's those that are going to inhabit that. But, you know, in the earlier construction, uh, perhaps when there were, um, when the family was smaller, um, more people of the community may have been involved in the construction of the compound. And of course, as you produce uh, more children and more descendants, male and female, there are more hands to work in, in extending the compound. And so you have, um, you have these rooms and, and, you know, in the other diagram, we had sitting room. Usually sitting rooms are uh, associated with the male heads of, uh, 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 of families, uh, even polygynous families. And so you would have, let's say, for example, even though these are all simply designated as rooms or are for rooms, one of these would be a sitting room, one would be designated for a wife, of uh, an additional wife. And then there would be a room where all of the, uh, and in the uh, room with the wife, uh, the husband has his own room and um, the wives may come. And uh, when it's her turn to, her turn to sleep with her husband, if you're in a polygynous situation, she may come to his house or come to his room or his uh, apartment within this complex and uh, stay with him the night. And so the women will rotate um, in order. And so there's some sense of order to everything. And then um, in her room, in, in the wife's room would live the, um, um, her daughters. But the, young, but the young boys, when they grow up and reach, um, let's say, they're at a pre-puberty age or puberty, they move to another room where they all live together. So the boys of the compound live together or live together in a room. And then in the morning they will come and, you know, well, they will eat breakfast prepared by their mothers and so forth. And so the, uh, it, Yoruba families are very well organized in this sense. And so there is a place for um, there's a place for everyone and a place for every situation. Any questions or comments? Yes. Um, so you you, you kind of touched on this, but I just wanted to this is something that I heard and maybe you can verify that. OK, if there are multiple wives, the first wife is the one that designates the order uh, who gets to, uh, you, you know, what day um, mm -hmm. a, 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 another wife gets to share that husband. Is, is, that, is that your understanding? Uh, that is correct. And thank you for uh, uh, alluding to that. Um, you know, um, usually the first wife is the senior wife. 
And so it is this, and remember I said seniority is very important in Yoruba society. The second senior most wife then would be the second person or the second woman who married uh, the husband. And so, um, and so right on down to the junior wives. And so the senior wife is, is accorded obviously a certain level of esteem and, um, and among the other wives, uh, all of the wives of the compound, it is the senior most wife in the compound that is designated as the Iyale, or the woman who, who has the, um, the group of women. Now the women, just as men um, who are members of the lineage, and I, I shouldn't say just say the men, but the men and women who are members of the lineage will meet to, to because they are a corporation or the lineage acts as a corporate body. And so they have uh, family business or lineage business to discuss and decisions to make. And in the same way, the women of the household are organized and they meet separately. And in that way, they um, uh, discuss the affairs of the house. And um, if there's a big celebration that's coming up, who, who's going to do the cooking, uh, who's going to prepare what foods, um, and um, who's going to do the setup, uh, the physical setup for the uh, celebration that's going to take place. So that everybody um, um, uh, has been, uh, everyone is organized. Now this statement that uh, here, the open spaces uh, or courtyards are designed to be, um, much larger so as to encourage communication between family members. It serves as a point uh, of social contact, cooking and craft making, family meetings, political gatherings, social gatherings like ceremonies and weddings, food processing, and also um, uh, used as a court to settle disputes. So the courtyard is very important. It's where the family business takes place. But notice, that you will only know what's going on in that family because there it's built with all of the doors opening to the interior of the courtyard and so the family business is kept within the family <laughs> well let me ask you this brother Bamman daly mm -hmm. um how do they handle the, the goings and comings you have any insights in terms the going and comings of members of the compound, the ones that may choose to leave and the ones that may invite and have somebody to come in. Um, how do they deal with those kind of interactions? And when you say invite and come in, what do you mean? Well, I mean, there are daughters in the, in the compound. If um, they are married, would they leave the compound or would the husband come to that compound? Or if there is a... a a husband, uh, would he mm -hmm. go to his wife compound or would he bring her to this particular compound? Any insights into that? Yes, okay. Let's go back here to this kinship diagram. Now remember these are all, those that are in black are members of the same patrilineage. And so this woman is a member of the patrilineage. If she decides to come back and visit her family, uh, she may come uh, with her husband and with her children and accommodations will be found for them uh, within the compound, mm -hmm. um, but they are not going to stay. They are visiting there. So they are there for a short while. It, and so usually when daughters marry, they marry out and they go and live with their husbands. Mm -hmm. Remember, um, not only is, is, uh, is the Yoruba society patrilineal, it's patrilocal, meaning that you live in the space where your father lives, or you live in the space where your husband's father lives. And so that's how uh, that functions in a patrilineal society. Okay. Um, uh, uh, so I, I, I spoke about the, uh, the bale, the iale, the seniority of birth. 
Uh, and so seniority of birth is very important um, uh, because there are senior brothers and sisters and then there are junior brothers and sisters. And while seniority is important, uh, I mean, uh, is certainly important, um, even among brothers and sisters, um, it becomes a, it becomes certainly important in polygynous families because, um, again, senior seniority of birth is important. Um, uh, or uh, just one second. And while that is important, sometimes the children of one mother are uh, the, uh, the omo iya, or the mother of one children, uh, are sometimes uh, spoken of as the corner or the corner of the house, meaning that they constitute a, a profound unit. Um, uh, and there is a attention to safeguarding um, um, there is attention to safeguarding the interests of that household because certainly in a patrilineal society, men uh, um, access to lineage lands are primarily uh, the person that generally has access to lands are the men because they are living in the area. They are farming the land. But, you know, the wife marries out and moves to her husband's compound. And so she becomes a resident of that compound and the access to her children's land accrues to, not through her, to her father's compound, but through their father, uh, through her husband, to their compound, which is patrilineally based. Now, I know that this might seem really complicated. And so, so often when we see uh, or read about descriptions of Black families are big and they're extended families, and they're just like extended families in Africa. Well, yes, to a point, but there are more formal structures in place that govern the structure of these families on the uh, continent of Africa. Um, uh, Baba, can I say something? Yes, ma'am. This is so absolutely wonderful, but I have experienced or have seen firsthand how this actually works. Uh, Ron Nefer Amon of the Saraset Society has multiple wives. I studied with them um, for about four years. And what the, he had five wives. And when you say they work as a corporation, that is exactly what they did. So I was smiling to myself. I said, he must have read Baba's book. Where we, he must have read your book because there was a school. One wife ran the school. There was a credit union. One wife ran the credit union. There was um, a bookstore and a, a clothing store. One wife did that. One wife did all of the singing for the meditations that, that were happening all the time. And another wife, she was kind of young. She was having babies every year. So, and, and it absolutely did work. They all lived in the same house. They each had their own bedrooms, but like you said, they would go to his room at different times. But this is just so phenomenal. Um, and the part about the young men going with the fathers at a certain point, that is so profound. Because if we could get just that part together, well, first of all, we have to get some men that are of this mindset. But look at what would happen with our youth, uh, our men of today. We wouldn't have these multiple, you know, notches on the hips with all the baby mamas. This is so fantastic. And I am enjoying it immensely. Thank you so much. Well, but thank, I've seen it. thank you so very much. And thank you for adding, uh, uh, adding your commentary here because this, it, it's very, um, uh, it's very important. Uh, as um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, don't put my hand up. Okay. I came in a little late. Sorry about that. You might've covered it. 
I wanted to ask you before a man on additional wives, does he have from the elders in the village or something like that to be sure that the women will be well taken care of? Usually yeah. uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Yoruba society, before a man, before a man marries, and certainly before a man takes on an additional wife, um, bride wealth presentations are made. Now, this is not a man buying a wife or buying a woman, but bride wealth presentations are made. And mm -hmm. at the time that bride wealth presentations are made, the families investigate each other and investigate yeah. each other's extended families to uh -huh. see if they are fit to be their in-law. And so I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, because because, uh, just real quick, it's not like in America where, oh, he sees somebody he really likes and he goes, oh, I'm gonna get her. Yes, there is, a, oh, so phenomenal. Let me be quiet and let Baba do this. <laughs> Um, this is so exciting. This is so wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you so very much. And I appreciate your, uh, your, your commentary. Now, remember earlier, I said, um, I'm trying to find the slide. Um, uh, oh, we we're going to talk to about the intergenerational transmission okay. of occupations, titles, okay. divinities, land use, and land ownership. Now, I want to talk about the intergenerational, um, um, uh, the divinities. Here are um, uh, 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 here are um, devotees of Oshun, the the divinity Oshun. And so you can tell Oshun because Oshun's color is yellow or the color of brass. Now, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, we have been taught that Oshun's color is gold. Um, I don't know if that's a, a function of the capitalism that's in the Western Hemisphere, but uh, yellow, the color of brass, is associated with Oshun. So notice that the uh, women, you know, uh, we, we, when we saw the photograph of the family earlier, notice that they were all dressed alike. But on certain celebration days and uh, or certain feast days, the the devotees of Oshun uh, or in or or any of the divinities are all dressed alike. And um, so you have um, you have this uh, yellow here, and you know given the fact that. Some men, uh, some women in, in this, uh, or some men and women may be devotees of Oshun. Uh, and Oshun is the, um, regarded as the divinity of the sweetness of life. Uh, she is a female divinity. She's associated with, particularly with water, uh, as is uh, another divinity, Yemoja. And so we have. Uh, you inherit your divinities, um, or the, you get to know the divinities through some uh, extraordinary circumstance governing your life where you must appeal to them. And so that's important. Uh, I talked about twins earlier. Excuse, and so- Excuse me. Um, I, 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 you know, uh, my Western tongue pronounce and hears things differently. So what the, the female um, divinity or Orisha that you just mentioned, is it also pronounced Yemenya? No, that would be, there is another one oh, called okay. Yemoja or okay, okay. Uh, in the Yoruba pronunciation, uh, Yemoja or Yeye Omo Eja, Yemoja. Uh, but uh, a several Sundays ago, uh, maybe a couple of months or so ago, uh, the one of the songs, um, um, I think Baba Sidney, uh, Mama Connie, um, uh, Baba Tai, and um, someone else, they were all singing a song 
in praise of Oshun. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard that, I, you know, that stood out in my mind. And I said, oh, OK. And so I, I said, you know, this takes me back to Nigeria. And so. Um, uh, and so. Uh, so, yes, but Yemoja is a different uh, or okay. Yemaja oh, oh, oh. or some people say Yemaja uh, is a different div uh, divinity. Okay. Now. Um, Thank you. Uh, it is said that Oshun, uh, yeah, I think the divinity is Oshun. Oshun and Shango uh, had twins. And so the twins are regarded as the children of Shango uh, or the Omo Shango. Um, and so when twins are born, um, and the Yoruba has the highest incidence of twin births in the uh, anywhere in the world. There is a high possibility that um, th there's a high possibility or a higher possibility that one of the twins will die, in which case an ere uh, ibeji or a twin image is constructed, or if both of them die, then a male and a female uh, image is constructed. And so these are presented as, um, uh, even though they are short in stature, they're presented as, uh, as, as uh, adults, or in this case, uh, um, uh, obviously miniature. And so we see, in this case, we see the breast on the female. Um, and, um, but if only one should die only, uh, so that, uh, a carving is made and, uh, it is treated as a living entity, food is touched to its mouth. Um, uh, uh, it is ritually bathed. It is put to bed at night and covered up. So it's treated like a member of the family. And it's said that if um, that twins will bring, um, were once regarded as um, uh, abhorrent, but in a later point in Yoruba history where twins were said to bring good luck. And so we have, um, uh, we have the twins here. Now you'll see here the Ere Ibeji or the twin figures, and they're covered in uh, cowrie covered vests. And so this indicates that they are connected quite literally to Shango, because uh, often the devotees of Shango will often wear cowrie covered vests. And so this becomes important. Um, um, and so speaking of Shango, we know that Shango's color is red. Shango is the god of thunder, lightning, and fa fire. And so again, these divinities are passed from one generation to the next onto their descendants. But notice, now whether you are the, um, a male or a female divinity, um, the uh, your devotees are spoken of as uh, the Iya of the divinities or the wives of the divinities. Um, and so the complexity of gender and gender uh, um, notions becomes very important for us to make sure that we uh, understand and don't misread it. Now, we are not to read anything beyond that, but notice, for example, the males, uh, this male here who's holding the Oshe Shango, the Shango axe as it is called, is the um, Iya Shango or the wife of Shango. And notice that in the convention of the Yoruba, the wives of Shango marry or, or, or carry or, or um, often have these elaborate female hairdos, particularly during ceremonies. Notice here the male has his hair braided, terminating in a, uh, a point, uh, as we see here. Um, there are women that are here as well, but notice these males have their hair braided 
as well as this one. And so the Omo Shango, uh, the, the children of Shango and, uh, and, and those that are, um, those that are regarded as the devotees of Shango or the Iya Shango, um, this is uh, an important convention in terms of their dress. Um, now that does not interfere with their male identity. Let me make sure that I state that so that there is no confusion. And uh, here, uh, every uh, I wanted to emphasize that religion or spiritual traditions are very important. And so that when um, a member of the family of the patrilineage dies, uh, he is resurrected with cloth. And so there are uh, panels of uh, overlapping applique and uh, uh, piece uh, uh, cloth um, that are created. And so when the um, so that when the ancestor or the deceased person visits uh, you, that person will dance in a counter counterclockwise direction, like the tornadoes. And so tornadoes are regarded as a destructive force. And at the same time, they say that even when tornadoes visit, even though tornadoes can bring destruction, they give us an opportunity to create life anew. So we have a lot of um, philosophical uh, traditions that are uh, part of um, uh, this as well. And so when we think of um, <clears throat> marriage, there is monogamy. Most people are married monogamously, even in a polygynous society. Uh, but there is polygyny and um, uh, or polygamy. And polygamy has, uh, there are two variations. Polygyny, the marriage of one man to more than one wife, or polyandry, the marriage of, more, uh, of one woman to more than one husband. There are only few societies in Africa that have polyandry. The Bashilele of the Congo it would be one example. Uh, there, is, uh, there are one or two examples of the, um, um, of the, um, of uh, East African populations as well. Uh, but in the, among the Bashilele, um, the young men, because they're not older, they might have one wife in common. And as they marry, as they uh, procure the funds and so forth to uh, acquire a wife of their own, and then the last person that has, uh, uh, that's left with the wife is, is his alone. And so this is one way that the org that societies organize. And so they're organized very differently. Um, um, but in the, uh, in the, among the Yoruba, they certainly practice polygyny. When there is a death that occurs, a secondary marriage occurs. And so if this man's, uh, uh, one of his wives should die, there might be the expectation that, his sis that uh, her sister will be recruited to become his wife. Or in the case of the leveret, um, then a brother inherits his uh, uh, brothers, uh, his deceased brothers' wives. And so that becomes very important as well. And it's one way that sometimes we, we, we're often told that um, in Africa, a marriage is not between individuals, but is between family members. And so the idea of a sororate or a leveret union is important. So we see that you don't break the bond between, um, um, between a spouse and their family. And no, uh, okay, bride wealth. I had mentioned that word earlier. You know, when, um, when uh, a man is ready to get married, is, there's the expectation that he will make a presentation to the, um, 
expectant wife uh, or the fourth, uh, um, uh, his, his, uh, um, his bride to be. Now, this is not him buying a bride, but it's establishing a contract. And because that contract is in place, if a brother should die or a, uh, or a, a wife should die, then the leveret or the sororit kicks in. And so that person is still married and still has some sense of social security. Now, it is bride, it, bride wealth is generally made by men. Sometimes it's made by women. Uh, sometimes it's made by women on behalf of a deceased father. Uh, because you will still continue to marry a woman to his name. And uh, that woman will have relations with other men uh, or another man who will produce children who will be regarded as those of the deceased. And so passing property down becomes very significant. Or if, um, uh, let me go back up to the uh, earlier slide. Now look at the title of the first book uh, by Ife, Ife, Ife Amadiume, Male Daughters, Female Husbands, Gender and Sex in an African Society. We're talking about the Igbo people here, and this was written by an Igbo woman. And so if you only have males, and it is males who inherited who inherit from their fathers, you declare your daughter a male so that you too can inherit from that. And uh, there are cases of female husbands and we will discuss that uh, just a second. Um, Daly, yes. With the declaration of, um, of a female as a, um, as a husband, um, is that something that is just enunciated within the compound? Is that something that extends outside of, uh, of that compound into the uh, uh, the broader, say, kingdom where people would recognize her as such? Well, there are some there. There are limitations. It's even though the the institution of women marrying women is very widespread. However, it again, remember, the idea of marriage is to produce children. And in this case, if a woman is barren, especially among the Nuer people of, um, we were talking about, um, last week we were talking about Sudan. The Nuer people live in Sudan. And so if a woman is barren, she is regarded, quote unquote, as a man or is defined as a man. And so she is expected to then present bride wealth for and procure a wife or wives. She then allocates those wives, that wife or wives to, uh, 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 to men who will produce children. And she will then become the father of, those ch of her wife's children. So this is not about sex between women, and I don't want anyone to walk away from here with this under with uh, a misunderstanding. And so that the role of husband is not necessarily linked to being a man. And so, and when you know, uh, that's also true among the uh, among the people of Dahomey in West Africa. And in Oyotunji, the Yoruba village in South Carolina, where uh, African Americans have uh, 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 revitalized uh, not only their Africanity, but their Yoruba ness. One of the things early on in the history of Oyotunji, 
the women went out and they read and they talked about the very fact that women can even have uh, women. And so the, it was bolstering their argument for the independence and an understanding of the independence of women. And so that becomes very important. In um, um, uh, The Color Purple, the missionary Doris Baines goes on and on and on. She talks on and on when she's on the trip going back to Europe, uh, she there uh, on the ship. And she uh, talks about, she, uh, she has two wives. The, the chief of the village presented her one day with, uh, with two wives. But what Alice Walker does not explain in the story is that they were for her social security because with uh, wives, and this missionary was regarded as independent, she thought of herself and she wrote under the name of um, Jared, uh, she used a male pseudonym. And so she wasn't sure that whether or not the people in her village, uh, in her Olinka village, knew that she was a man or a woman. But in her case, she was presented with two, uh, uh, two, two brides or two wives, and she married them off and had, and then she had, she became the grandchildren of her, uh, of her, um, uh, she became the grandmother of her, uh, her of her wives, uh, children. And so she wasn't really their wife. Um, in some other societies, it is possible for a woman who is barren to present um, bride wealth for another woman who will then be annexed to her marriage. This annexation then allows her to claim those children made by the new wife as her children or the, uh, the woman, the barren woman's children. And so again, this is nothing new. You know, you in the, in the Bible, you recall the story of, um, hmm, I'm not a biblical scholar. <laughs> um, I think Sarah, um, uh, I, I cannot remember right now, but uh, Sarah and Abraham and, and what's her name? Uh, H H Hagar. Hagar. Or, yes. Yeah. Okay. There was a case of barrenness there. And so there was the idea of a, um, a supplement. So an additional person was able to come in and supply children. And so this becomes, you know, when we look at, we, when we look at our kinship family and marriage in African societies, we have to think, how do Africans ensure the social security of everyone, and especially the lineage that must continue to be uh, to continue to procreate um, and exist in perpetuity. And so this becomes very important. Um, I, I talked a little bit about the co-wife relationship. Children of one father among the Yoruba are known as Oboka. The children of one mother are known uh, uh, as Omo Iya. There is expected to be some degree, sometimes some friction between um, um, children, especially uh, not, not children, but wives, especially if one wife does not have any children and uh, another does. And so that can be, a, it can be a source of friction. And the postmarital residence in patrilineal societies, it's usually patrilocal. In some societies, it is matrilocal or with the wife's uh, family. But often uh, in a uh, society that is matrilineal, the husband might have a wife in several, um, in several different compounds because his wife has a place to live already. He does not have to provide that place. And so that becomes uh, uh, important. When we think of um, family and family dress, notice that at this uh, wedding celebration, all of the women 
And so this includes the, the relatives as well as the friends all have on yellow head ties. Uh, and in this family, uh, a so-called nuclear family, uh, we see the, the dress, the family dress is blue and white for this particular occasion. One of the things that I cannot emphasize enough is the centrality of women uh, in moral teaching in the Yoruba family system. And this is an article written by Yetunde Aluko. And, um, and um, Yetunde is an interesting name because we learn from that name in Yoruba, it means mother returns. So Yetunde was named uh, some, uh, was born sometime after her grandmother had died. And so she was given the name Yetunde, Mother Returns. And so um, let me read a little portion of this abstract, the first two, uh, two or three lines. Social order and peaceful coexistence are some of the primary goals in every human society. Central to maintenance of law and order in traditional Yoruba societies is the family. Uh, central uh, among the, the Yoruba people, women are socialized differently from men. This paper, rather than focus on the oppression of women in Yoruba cultural settings, examines and see the oppression of women is something that uh, European anthropologists often um, um, becomes a focus for their discussion. But she says, rather than focus on the oppression of women, her paper examines the series of significant contributions of women to the maintenance of social order and ethical well being of families. The feminine gender is not always synonymous with oppression and domination. Rather, family well being is mediated by the principle of complementarity between males and females. And I mentioned complementarity earlier. Uh, the term twin lineal as used uh, in an earlier presentation also referred to the complementarity of male and female roles uh, or gender linked roles in, in, in the society. I hope that this discussion and I've certainly tried to explain all of these anthropological terms as best I could and uh, to explain Difficult concepts like um, devotees being called the brides of Shango or um, uh, uh, the fact that women marry women. And in other cases, women don't actually marry women, but women will present bride wealth for other women on behalf of men. In some cases, like among the Igbo, it is possible for a woman to present bride wealth for a deceased son or a non-existent son, a son that she never had. And so it is a way for her to, pro to procure grandchildren who will take care of her in her elder years. And so social security and passage of property becomes very significant to understanding the kinship, family, and marital arrangements found in African societies. And um, because some things might seem anomalous to us as Americans, <laughs> does not mean that it is anomalous to the Africans. Social security and social well-being is very important. And I think that it is 6.30 and I have talked all of this time and not allowed any questions. I, I apologize. No, it, it, you know, people were mesmerized by the information. Um, uh, Sugar D put in the chat. She says, wow, this is so good. Thank you, Baba. Uh, Bobby Daly and and uh, then Sister Bobby uh, asked, um, it, it, "Do you recommend a book to read more about this subject?" And you had you had began that. Could you give that book again so that uh, people can, uh, or maybe put put that in the chat? Okay, it is difficult for me to you know. I as much as I have been in these uh, uh -huh. sessions, 
I, it is difficult for me to do that. But here it is, I'll leave this up for a second. If you're looking at, uh, if you want to learn more about Igbo society, uh, Ife um, Amadiume, male daughters, comma, female husbands, gender and sex in an African society. It's published in London by Zed Books. And this is an African woman, uh, an Igbo woman writing. Um, let me also indicate that um, um, Oye Ronke, Oye Wumi is a Yoruba woman and she has invented, she has written this book, The Invention of Women, Making Sense of Western Gender Discourses. And so this is a very good uh, book and an important book to read. But if you just want the strictly traditional understanding of Yoruba families, then read The Sociology of the Yoruba by Fadipe, Nathaniel Fadipe. Mm -hmm. uh, Sister, um, Sister Danisha has her hand up. Uh, go ahead, Sister Danisha. Um, Bob, I was wondering if you could just uh, briefly talk a little bit about uh, the significance of uh, godparents in West African uh, culture? <sighs> okay, I will almost have to say that I don't know anything about godparents and that I do know that there are godparents. And I would say that um, um, some godparents are out, um, or, or, or members other than one's uh, um, ex, quote unquote extended family. And then some are found within the extended family. And just like African-Americans, uh, some godparents are selected within uh, the family. Uh, usually they're uh, older uh, and they can wa offer wise instruction to the new parents. And at other times, they are persons that are relatively the same age of, as, um, uh, as the couple having uh, um, children. But I cannot really say anything about godparents, but if you have something, I, want, I would love for you to add to this discussion. Well, you know, I have a I have a little bit of extended family in Kumasi, um, so I was asked, uh, I guess, two years ago, to be the godparent of a a baby uh, mm -hmm. that was being born to uh, one of my associates in Kumasi, and and I I agreed, but I talked with a number of people, and I talked with my my guide and my partner because, first of all, I wanted to make sure I wasn't committing to like. <clears throat> you know, a four year degree <laughs> in America. Um, uh, but basically, you know, he told me ba what you said that it is, it, it, it isn't like a, uh, it wasn't some uh, additional, you know, commitment that it was, as you said, a commitment to uh, kind of help as a guide uh, and mm -hmm. to just a commitment to be in the child's life and to, you know, be an extended uh, family member. Um, and what excited me most is it gave me the title of uh, Nana. So um, the baby yes. now can talk and he tries to call me Nana. Beautiful. And you know, I, um, um, when you raised that question, it, it made me jump because, you know, I have a number of uh, God children. <laughs> from having been back and forth to Ghana many right. times. Right. And, um, and especially because my, uh, and especially friends of my uh, son, uh, won an American godfather <laughs> right. for, you know, for their children. Yeah. So, you know, um, but uh, uh, it's, um, it's an it's important because it's another level of adding social security and caring for everybody. I hope that we get from this presentation the importance of 
of the humaneness of, uh, of uh, African systems of kinship, family, and marriage, and gender relations. So would you say that it's uh, the main thing is keeping everybody connected um, in, in, the, in the family? That, uh, that's, what it, that's what it appears to me. Oh, yeah, it, it, it very much so is keeping everybody connected and keeping everybody in the family. And it's a way of in, um, it's keeping them connected, but keeping them connected with a purpose. How do you extend um, each generation? What arrangements can you make to ensure that if someone is barren or someone is, uh, can't have ch uh, a male that can't have children or a female that can't have children, what social arrangements do you make to ensure that the uh, that um, that there is a perpetuity of the lineage, and that becomes very important. How do you pass on property uh, in a society that deals? that passes property on primarily to males. Well, how do, you un how do you undo that unfairness? You declare your daughter a male. And so you, uh, uh, for that purpose, um, even your, the, your daughter is not prevent, that daughter is not prevented from uh, marrying um, and, and having children of her own, but it is one way of securing uh, and uh, securing a stronghold for a barren wife. You know, this has been a beautiful presentation. If you look in the comments here, Brother Katabazi says, excellent pr presentation. Mm -hmm. Brother Jeff says, outstanding, very thorough. Santi Sana, Minister Amadi says, it's fascinating information. Uh, I would have to give it a a uh, two thumbs up. Uh, it, it, it was it was outstanding, and I'm so glad that you were able to um, uh, give us this this um, uh, uh, a presentation. It, it, it's it's been really eye opening, uh, just from the standpoint, you know, because when I think of African societies, I I usually think of um, you know, mostly being matrilineal. And, and up until this point, I always thought that the Yoruba uh, the tradition was, was matrilineal. And uh, you, uh, you enlighten us to today about that. There's something I wanted to share. And, and that was, uh, you know, because when you were looking at the, uh, at the compounds, you know, the uh, glyph, in Kemet for, um, I didn't mean for that to happen. Let's see. When the glyph for Kemet for house, this is how you would write, you know, and hmm. people say, yeah, Pharaoh, um, you know, but it's really per ah. This is the per, this means house, and this is the great. So, this, so really it's per ah or great house. And uh, this is the way that they would designate the term mm -hmm. house. So I, 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 I found that interesting, uh, you, you know, mm -hmm. when, you, when you shared that, that uh, with us. So, you, you know, there's a continuity. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't mean that, um, you know, just because this is in West Africa or this is in Northeast Africa, you, you know, there's a, there's a cultural unity that, that seems to flow. And, and it keeps popping uh, back up, whether it's patrilineal, matrilineal. Great. One mm -hmm. of the things that I took from um, Brother Bama Davis' presentation is that they seem to have in place a, uh, a social structure that uh, incorporates and, um, and takes care of um, all of the people, you know, within the compound. I don't know if they would have the same kind of social services that we may be familiar with in the, in this uh, in this country, but in the absence of those kind of things, mm -hmm. uh, they have a system that indeed incorporates um, the people and, um, as uh, Brother Bama Davis said, provide a form of social security for the uh, the older members uh, of their compound. Um, and I'm not sure what we could take from 
from the different um, uh, versions that we saw that might be applicable to for us here. But I think that since um, the people in um, in South Carolina have a compound, that that may be worth us taking a look at too. I mean, it's here on this soil, and they have this compound uh, as to what type of um, yeah, well, how things work for them. You know, they have the 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 orthodox system that um, we just talked about from uh, from Nigeria. I have they, you know, made various modifications and, and, and tailored it to make it fit and work here. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that would may that would be interesting to look at at some um, some point too. And let yeah. me say that the uh, Gullah people uh, in South Carolina, there is limited plural marriage, <laughs> uh, uh, and these are African Americans who. And the way it operates there, sometimes a man will have a house, will extend the house and do, uh, and construct um, the additional house for the additional wife um, uh, with a wall between the, the, the two families or the two segments of the, um, and so the brothers and sisters grow up knowing each other, loving each other, understanding each other, but, um, and appreciating each other. And the wives uh, obviously understand and, and uh, know that they are there, or either the, sometimes uh, they will build a two-story house with one wife on one floor and the other wife on the, uh, one on the lower, one on the upper level. And so, um, Again, I said this is rare. There is a farm family system that has been described in the 1930s by an African-American sociologist on a polygynous farm family system, which deals with an African-American setting. In, um, I think it's, um, that article is cited um, in one of the articles that I had uh, written. Uh, Minister Imhotep, you said that you put those things in a, uh, you couldn't put them in the chat, but you sent them in an email. You know, um, uh, okay, so I, 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 I've been trying to save them so I could put them in the chat. Oh, okay. Let me well, see if I can. Not, not that you have to do it, not right now. Uh -huh. But uh, let me say also that in terms of polygyny, uh, often, when people talk about reinstituting African family traditions in the Western context, and by the Western context, I mean the United States of America, folk jump on poly polygyny, uh, and, uh, specifically. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I said, you know, and uh, I was at a conference in Detroit um, uh, one year. And this topic came up and um, it was proffered by some males in the audience. And, you know, I could only stand up and say, you know, I think that one of the most revolutionary things that we can do is for one black man to marry one black woman, love her and get along well. And if we did that, that would yes. be revolutionary. Yes. Now, yes. I'm not saying that that it's unrevolutionary to have other thoughts, but let us deal with one uh, situation very well and ensure that we set good examples for our children and grandchildren. Let me let me ask you this. I, I wasn't going to bring it up, but but since you uh, have kind of touched on it. Um, and, you know, we, we've gone over time and uh, obviously people want to stay and uh, we don't have to get out. Uh, <clears throat> what is what is the origin of uh, polygamy? Do you know? I think that. Uh, uh, I see your hand, Judy. You're next. Yeah, I think that it comes about in part as a result of a sex uh, imbalance in the sex ratio, the number of adult males to the number of adult females. Um, and sometimes there, there are status linked uh, behaviors with that um, as, as well. But I think that 
the primary thing is the sex ratio or the imbalanced sex ratio. Uh, once I was with a group of um, um, highly mobile upper middle upper upper middle class uh, African Americans, and they were in a relatively wealthy suburb of Detroit. Uh, I, I used to live in Detroit, and I lived in Ann Arbor. And um, one of the women commented uh, about her friend, uh, and I think she was from Liberia, I think Liberia, and that uh, she was giving her advice on not to deal with uh, a polygynous husband, a polygynous husband and so forth. I said, and I you know, interrupted and I was not part of that conversation. I said, in a society where there are uh, more women than men, would you prefer a woman to be married to a, uh, a plurality of women be, uh, being married to one man? Or you, would you prefer the woman to have children outside wedlock? And how'd that, of course, how'd that go over? <laughs> <laughs> that oh, was oh, by not, the way, that was not anticipated, and so sure. I raised the inconvenient question. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's even when we think about our families in the United States of America, men that have a plurality of um, uh, that have. Um, Plural, as I say, plural domestic group affiliations. <laughs> oh, that's such a nice way to put it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we have to understand um, that that does occur. I mean, it does occur, and but people still know their brothers and sisters, and in many cases, and sometimes they don't. And in some situations, how do we? Um, how do we understand and account for our father's behaviors? And I mean, our collective father's behaviors. Yeah. Uh, how do we understand a man that might eat in one household, sleep in another household, discipline children in yet another household, and contribute financially to yet another household, and all of those households are linked to not one man, but to a group of men and women, to several households that function as a family. And so, you know, and sometimes, and how do we deal with the, um, when we don't even talk about it in our own culture, how do we deal with mother's brother? And so we often think about men as irresponsible beings in families, when in fact they may not be taking care of their own children, but they may be taking in part some in part care of their sister's children. And so that is going on in our community, but we rarely ever talk about it because we are so concerned with for uh, um, having 2.4 children living in a box with their husband, uh, with their father and their mother, that we don't understand and appreciate, or at least document the other kinds of uh, uh, realities that are going on in our community. And I am so sick of sociologists talking about those 2.4 children and living in a box as opposed to, come on, can we get real? Can we talk about what we have going on in our community? I'm not excusing uh, uh, irresponsible behavior, but I am saying, I can ex uh, uh, say that we, I can um, not excuse irresponsible sociology or irresponsible anthropology. We are social scientists and we have, the, we have the right to understand and to understand who we are, how we behave, critique it, but understand it. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm going on a soapbox. Um, well, no, no, that, that, that's very good. So Sister Judy had her hand up and then, and then Mama and Gina. And uh, I want everybody to know that I put both of the documents that 
Brother Bob and Daly uh, sent me. They're both in the chat. Uh, so you can get those of uh, his PowerPoint uh, that he put up, uh, uh, that he uh, showed us. Uh, plus, he had something on uh, women and the Gullah family. It's in a zip file. So you can you can say that uh, to yourself. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Judy, and then then Mama and Gina. Yes, I was just going to say, um, Brother Bob and Deli, um, you know, I'm I'm used to being in the book study with you, but I'm telling you, I have a whole new um, respect for you. Um, I think I'm now going to call you professor, or should I say doctor? Um, but I really enjoyed the presentation. It was very well done, very fascinating. And this is one of the things when I first came to Black, um, Black Knowledge Matters and was first introduced by Bill Johnson, MIT Bill, um, to the community, I was just fascinated because I love to be around scholars and just like to see that intelligentsia and you really brought it and you delivered and I'm so happy. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very fascinating subject. I didn't get to hear the beginning, but I'll be listening to the recording and I just wanted to tell you I really appreciated it and it was great. Well, thank you so very much. And I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Uh, okay. let, let, me, let me just state that um, um, I am primarily known as having worked in, in museum settings. And I have done so in, 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 uh, in four or five different museums. But I've in between working in museums, I have also taught. I taught at Washington Community College in Ann Arbor. And I taught at Southern University. Uh, 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 SUNO, the Southern uh, University at New Orleans. I remember, I remember you sharing that with us. It's very evident that you, you know, that you are skilled in being a professor and as well being working in museums. I see that you have a very peaceful spirit about you. And I think that's what you have to do in museums. You speak softly <laughs> and calmly, but as always, you know, scholarly information. Thank you. I'm very excited about this presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Very good. Go ahead, Mom and Gina. Thank you, Judy. And again, Baba, this has been so phenomenal. And I am just, just upset with myself. I had no idea when I would sit next to you or close to you <laughs> at Wose, the the brilliance and the magnificence that I was in the presence of the company of. Absolutely fantastic. My introduction to polygamy was that, well, not my introduction to it, but my first knowledge of it was that it was instituted for the offering women and children mm -hmm. because the men died in the war and fight and there, the women were left on their own. And mm -hmm. then by taking on a second wife, um, we could. We you went, you went, uh, you, 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 your mute came on, uh, 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 Mom and Gina. Take, try to take that off. Okay, go ahead. What is, I have a leak in my kitchen. I have a leak coming from my. Oh, no. uh, fixture so i have to go but absolutely fantastic and if we could get america us american african americans together i don't think this would be such a bad idea but i think as you mentioned before it should be limited mm -hmm. at some point because we're not well my hoa is going to call me back but oh, we're oh. not we're not ready for it because my and when the people that I've talked to about it, the women are possessive. Oh no, well he mine. Uh, 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 uh. You know, <laughs> you get the the the, the rolling out the neck, and they don't get it. It's about the children. It's about the elders, like you said, somebody to carry on the lineage, mm -hmm. and to protect our children. And then the part that you brought up, social security for the elders. You know, yeah. it just. There's so many ways that if we if we were brought up with this, it would make sense. But because we're not, and we haven't been, it's it's far fetched. But it it has always made sense to me to a limit, to a limit. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't say that you can have just and and it has to be that you can take care of them. 
You know, it can't be that you have a second wife and you send them all down to the AFDC to, <laughs> to get welfare. You know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, and I had this discussion for those who know with Bula and Layla in the room, Baba, um, uh, some scholars in the room. Dr. Wade Nobles was in the room. He has a take on this. He said, if polygamy should be something we could look at. So I've been in the room with some high hitters, some heavy hitters that don't think this is such a bad idea. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again, Baba. Thank you. I, wish I, I would have treated you the same because I've loved you then like I love you now. <laughs> but I had no idea how great you really were. And oh. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have to talk again about this. But again, I do have this leak coming from a light fixture in my kitchen. So let me get back and see. They're sending a plumber. I know that. Oh, good. No. Okay. Don't yeah, touch it yeah. yourself. All right. Oh, right. No. Yeah. Right. no way. Well, All right. Member right. State Hotel. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Mama Rose. Uh -huh. This is Mama Rose. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for the presentation tonight. And the one thing I'm getting from this is I just wish I can help my complete family under one roof. That would be fantastic. I know it would work. But what I want to say to Baba is that a little over 20 years, I was in Senegal, and I have experienced every compound that he spoke about. The first one was with the open door, open gate, and the courtyard where the kitchen was centered and everyone came to that one spot to, to eat. But the, the elder had the center rooms. Each one had rooms, and it was so so profound to see that. And then the next one I visited was where they, the whole family was in the one compound, but they had like individual housing. And the other two I visited actually did not have the whole family. They had husband, wife, and kids, but they were all together. And the fifth one I visited was just so elegant. It was a a two-story compound with the complete family from grandmother on down, but they were very wealthy and it, the whole place was just elegant. Living room, you had two living room in one. You had, they had full staff, nobody cooked. They had people doing everything. They had complete bathrooms. So even then, it was really wonderful. So I, I, I'm sure it's even greater today. So yes, I experienced all those different compounds. So thank you for that. All thank right. you. All thank right. you. Um, um, Mama Fua wrote to Santi Sana, dear brother Bamandele, I can understand more of our culture heritage for our relations. I hope you can share more of your knowledge. Um, uh, glad that you all were able to stay Brother Bauman Daly, uh, outstanding, top ranking, uh, uh, very oh, informative. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, presentation and discussion.